Fear, like trauma, can scar us in different ways. For me, I was driven deep into my head, made reclusive, fearing the man that I was meant to love, my father Morris. From a young age, I looked for escape, immersing myself in the romance of superstition and a world of make-belief, yet seeking inspiration in my family's fossil dust. Generations repressed into silence. Emotion seen as a weakness that had to be suppressed. A family from a fading England. Priests and politicians. Even a prime minister. And young officers in the battlefields of oblivion that claimed first my grandmother's two brothers and then her beloved son. A family upon whose tree dragons writhed, and where humour rarely smiled. I was once told a story. A man was scattering sand from a bag that he carried. Why are you scattering that sand? An onlooker asked. It's magic sand to keep dragons away. The man replied. But there are no dragons here, remarked the onlooker. You see, said the man, it works. Like the man who scattered sand, we all have a need to believe in something, to escape the reality of both the present and the memory of which we cannot speak, even to those we love. I never felt that I knew my father, other than as a man of silence. A silence that I too learn today. When Morris did speak, it was of simple things, of the weather and of animals. By learning, he was an engineer. During the Second World War, the builder of railways and bridges. By 1941, he was the youngest officer to hold the rank of major in the British Army, as the Allies pushed south from India into Burma and Siam, which are today called Myanmar and Thailand. But oh yes, my father indeed had his dragons. Seldom speaking of wartime memories, apart from mentioning the animals. Men who caught snakes with their teeth Naughty monkeys, he told me, lived in golden temples. Then there was that which he did not talk about. What was it that closed my father's mind until his death in April 2007? Amongst his things, I found some papers and some photographs. My need to understand 
took me and my new family to Thailand's border country. Here, Morris had spoken of elephant journeys in a jungle where roads had no place until a railway came. The one on which I am travelling, beside the River Kwai. The Japanese drove north, up through Siam, to confront the Allies by building this railway. Later, this line was to be their means of retreat. Using primitive tools and under great hardship, 30,000 Allied prisoners of war and over 100,000 Thai forced labourers constructed this 415 kilometre track between Thailand and Myanmar for the Japanese military in just 14 months a project estimated to take five years. They call it a death railway. The Kwai Bridge is a somber place. Amongst his papers, Morris noted bad times when the cholera hit. With the Thai laborers drinking just river water, and having no medical attention, 80,000 died in the jungle. The Allied prisoners had to go out, gather them up, put them in piles and burn them. Of the Allied prisoners of war, almost half died. Those that did survive were carried out in an operation in which my father was a part work for which he was awarded the MBE. More than 7,000 of the prisoners of war rest here in the Kanchanaburi War Cemetery. Among them are friends of my father. Only three Thai graves are known of. The thousands are perhaps remembered in the temples with monkeys. And what of me in my time of unknowing? As a child, I'd escaped my father's dark silences. Nature was my escape. An ash tree was my sanctuary. Edge hollowed, it was the place of my early imaginings. Imaginings to which I returned childlike as a means of coping with my new fears and trauma when my heart was replaced with that of a mourned soul. Transplanted, 